the third chapter of Philippians. We'll begin reading with verse number 10. The Apostle Paul writes and he says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death and so somehow to attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. The title of my message today is Making Progress. Making Progress. I know that over the last uh, year and a half or so, it's been hard for many of us to focus on making progress in life. For many folks, the focus has been on surviving (laughs) the craziness, right? Getting through. And we understand that. We've been living in unprecedented times. But I submit to you this morning that God wants us, even in the midst of challenging times, not just to do our best to maintain, not just to do our best to survive, not just to make it through to the weekend, (laughs) but he wants us to thrive. He wants us to move forward. He wants us to make progress in our lives, in our uh, church, in our calling. Amen? Amen? God wants us to make progress, to move forward. One of the things that we need to realize is that progress, by its very nature, means change. So, if we are resistant to change, and we probably all are to some degree or another, but if we are largely resistant to change, that means we are resistant to progress, to moving forward. There was a survey done about attitudes toward change. There are, first of all, people known as the early innovators, about 2.6%. They're the ones who run with new ideas. Thank God for early innovators. Then there are the early uh, adopters, uh, 13.4%. They are influenced uh, by the innovators, but not uh, innovators themselves. Then there are the slow majority. That's uh, one of the biggest groups. That 34%, the herd followers. You know, once something becomes a thing, you know what I mean by that? You, you know, it's, is it a thing? Is it, is it, is it a tra- Is it, you know, something that's really taking place? Then the herd follows that. Then there's the reluctant majority. You know, the ones, that, and they're 34% as well. And, and they just come kind of kicking and screaming into change. And then the last group is the group antagonistic to change, 16%. They will never change no matter what. Um... Uh, So uh, we have to ask ourselves, how do we stand in relation to change, in relation to making progress? Heard about a man that went to the doctor. The doctor said to him, sir, you're in terrible shape. You've got to do something about it. First, tell your wife to cook more nutritious meals. Also, stop working like a dog. You work too hard. Inform your wife that you're going to make a budget because you have financial stress and tell her she has to stick to that budget. And have her keep the kids off your back so you can relax. Because unless there are some drastic changes like this in your life, you're going to be dead in a month. Doc, the patient said, this would sound more official coming from you than from me. Could you please call my wife and give her those instructions? The doctor said, I'll be glad to. When the fellow got home, his wife rushed to him. She said, I just talked to your doctor. 
poor man, you've only got 30 days to live. <laughs> Change. Making progress. Paul here talks in verse 10 about his ambition. He said, uh, and it was quite an ambition, I want to know Christ, and the, con the, 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 the connotation here is not to know intellectually, but to know experientially. How many know there's a difference between knowing and knowing? I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Paul had said in, in, in Romans, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead shall make alive our mortal bodies. I want to know the power of his resurrection and the fellowship. Oh, here's, here's where we stop up short. And the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. We don't hear too many in the Christian world talking about sharing in the sufferings of Christ, do we? The fellowship, we talk about fellowship with one another. Fellowship is more than just dinners. It's a having something in common. I want to have in common, in other words, the Christ's suffering, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. We love talking about resurrection, don't we? But in order to have a resurrection, you have to have a death first. We have to die to self. We have to die to our desires, our plans, our dreams, our ambitions, our convenience. I want to know him. I want to share in the fellowship of his sufferings so that I can attain to the resurrection of the dead. That was Paul's ambition. But uh, Paul, after this, delineates what is necessary to have this take place. And so this morning, for the next few minutes, I want to answer the question, what things are necessary for us to move forward into what God has for us? Keeping in mind that progress, moving forward, means change. How many want to move forward this morning? How many want to move forward? Okay, what things are necessary for us to move forward into what God has for us? The first thing is this. It's dissatisfaction with where we are. Dissatisfaction with where we are. In verse 12, Paul says, Not that I have already obtained all this, or I've already been made perfect, and perfect there means made complete. And in verse uh, 13 he says, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. I have this ambition, I have this goal, but I'm not there yet. You know, when you have an ambition, when you have something you want to achieve, when you have something that means everything to you, and you're not there yet, it's not a reality yet, you are dissatisfied. Am I right? Yes. This is what I want. This is what I'm, 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 I want to move toward. This is my goal. But I'm not there yet. And that should bring about a holy dissatisfaction with where we are. See, the problem with us many times, and I said us because I include myself, I've told you, God always preaches this sermon to me before I preach it to you, and he does a much better job than I do, let me tell you. The problem with us is that we are, many times, by and large, very comfortable with where we are in God. You know, we have a don't rock the boat mentality. I go to church on Sunday, or watch it on TV, I pay my tithes, if you do that. I hope you do. We need it. I, you know, I'm, things are, I'm, I love the Lord. You know, things are just good. I said last week that Paul was a spiritual, and forgive me for this term, but he was a spiritual superstar. And, and that next to Jesus Christ, he was the most godly man that ever walked the face of the earth. And you know what this spiritual superstar, this godly, uh, uh, super godly man said? I'm not there yet. I'm not happy with where I am. <clears throat> Let me tell you, if he could say that, I know I can say it. 
When's the last time you and I just got so dissatisfied with where we are spiritually? When's the last time we said, I want more? I want to move forward. Lord, I want to know you better. Lord, I want to share in the fellowship of your sufferings. Lord, I want to know the power of your resurrection. Lord, I want to bind myself more closely to you than ever before. Or does our attitude say, doing okay. Now, don't misunderstand me. There is a contentment, there is a joy in serving Jesus. I'm not saying we should walk around miserable all the time. The worst thing in the world is a miserable Christian. I'm not not saying, you know, we should be doom and gloom and miserable all the time. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is we should recognize that every remaining day of ours on this earth, we are a work in progress. And while we experience the joy of the Lord... We recognize that we are a work in progress. We are not the finished product. And so we are, in a very real sense, dissatisfied with where we are, not because we're uh, unhappy with what God is doing or has done in our lives, but because we realize there's more and we're not there yet. In her book, Dancing in the Desert, Marsha Crockett writes, sometimes discontentment is a good sign. It acknowledges our incompleteness, our yearning for fulfillment, in the emptiness of our souls. Sometimes the greatest prayer you and I can pray is, Lord, give me a holy discontentment, a dissatisfaction with where I am in you, so that I yearn for more of you, so that I want to make progress in you. Picture this scene in the Old West. Cowboys in the 1870s are gathered around a fire after a day out on the open range. That fire is spreading the heat and it's comfortable. Suddenly, a bellow of pain erupts from one of the cowboys and then another. You might say, what are you talking about? Well, uh, they were wearing Levi's jeans. And uh, in the first days of uh, the existence of Levi's jeans, uh, they were reinforced at the stress points with copper rivets. And one of those rivets was strategically placed in the crotch area. (laughs) And so that fire would heat up and they would start dancing and not uh, in the spirit either. (laughs) And nothing changed until uh, Walter Haas Sr. in 1933, the president of Levi Strauss, went camping and he experienced hot rivet syndrome. Guess what? They changed where they put their rivets after that. Dissatisfaction. Dissatisfaction. How about you? Are you satisfied with where you are spiritually? Are you satisfied with your walk with the Lord? Well, Pastor Tim, you know, I'm no Billy Graham. I'm not, you know, I'm just, you know, we have this kind of false modesty. Well, I'm just an average Joe just doing the best I can. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I went into a John Wayne voice there. I don't know why. I just circle the wagons. No, but, I, you know, I'm just... Uh, yeah. And we have this false modesty, which should be a dissatisfaction where we are and say, God, I want more. I want more. So the first necessity for moving forward into what God has for us is a dissatisfaction with where we are. Second uh, necessity is a devotion to a singular pursuit. In verse 13, the latter part of verse 13, uh, Paul said, I, I do not consider myself yet to have, uh, to have taken hold of it. Uh, but he said, this one thing I do. One thing I do. Paul said, I am not there yet, spiritually. But it's my singular pursuit. It's my primary focus in life. It's what animates me. It's what my life is all about. I said, Pastor Tim, you have to excuse Paul. You know, he didn't live in the 21st century like we do. He didn't have to deal with all the stuff we do. Well, he had to deal with a few things. <laughs> 
You know, we, 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 we sometimes read our current situation back into, into scriptures written a couple thousand years ago, and we say, you know, this, this just doesn't relate to my life. But yes, it does. Paul said, this is my primary focus. Sure, he had to deal with uh, the, the, the cares of the ministry and other things he did in life. But he said his focus was on moving forward in Christ. Somebody once said, we need to remember that the main thing in life is to keep the main thing the main thing. And we have so many things in life, all of us do, I do, you do, that scream for our attention. Chuck Swindoll once talked about the tyranny of the urgent. How many know the urgent can exert a tyranny in our life to the exclusion of the important? Can I tell you this? If you and I are waiting for a time to get serious about God, more serious than ever before, we're waiting for a time when there aren't things screaming for our attention and when we don't have a lot of irons in the fire, when we don't have a lot going on. If we're waiting for that time to say, boy, when things are slowed down a bit, then I'm really going to get, you know, I'm really going to go 100% for God. Can I tell you when that time will come? Never. Never. God doesn't want to be last on our list. He wants to be first. Lord, I acknowledge I'm not there yet. I'm not the finished product yet. But Lord, I want to be single-minded in my pursuit of you. You above all else. Where does God rate on your priority list today? Where does he rate? I have to ask myself that. Where does God rate on the priority list Since uh, 1974, uh, in the American League, they have had something, Major League Baseball, known as the designated hitter. Because historically, pitchers have been such poor hitters, there, there are a few exceptions, but pitchers have been such poor hitters that uh, they, they uh, instituted a hitter, someone who wouldn't play in the field, but he would bat in the pitcher spot every time. The National League has never had that except last year during, during COVID, and uh, speculation is that next year the National League will adopt it. It will be throughout baseball. But the, the interesting thing is when uh, a, a National League team, when, when, when there is interleague play, one team during the season plays a team from the other league, you adopt the, the rules of the home team. So when a National League, uh, excuse me, when an American League team plays in a National League park, there's no designated hitter, and so the pitchers have to bat. The problem is, most of them haven't batted for years. They don't work on it in spring training. They don't practice it because in their league, they don't hit. And so they're at a, a disadvantage. Uh, at, uh, but uh, they don't, and even, even in the National League where pitchers bat, they, they don't, they practice some, but they don't really focus on that. Why? Because that's not what they get paid millions of dollars to do. They get paid millions of dollars to pitch. And so how much time do you think they work on their hitting versus how much they work on their pitching? Little to none. Because they are focused on what's important. That's why they're paid the big bucks. That's why they do what they do. And we need to have that kind of singleness of heart that our primary focus is on things of God. Just because you and I can do something doesn't mean we should. Effective leaders know what to focus their attention on while choosing not to do other things they could do. Billy Graham modeled this principle when he turned down NBC's offer of a million dollars to co-host. That's back when a million dollars was real money. That's the real money to me, I'm just kidding. But he turned down a million dollars to co-host a TV show and to star in two movies. He could have capitalized on his celebrity, but he said, no, that's not what my life is about. I'm called to preach the gospel. When the rich young ruler came to Jesus, saying he wanted to follow him, 
I want to be your disciple. Jesus said, uh, there's one thing you lack in Luke 18, 22. Sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then, come follow me. Why would Jesus say that? Is, is Jesus telling us we have to sell everything we own? No. For, for this young man, this was an issue. What's the issue in your life? You say, Jesus told him to sell all his wealth. Is, is there something wrong with wealth? Absolutely not. Is there something wrong with having money? No. It's, people misquote the scripture. It's not, it's not money that's the root of all evil. It's the love of money. God, God, God's kingdom is, is greatly enriched by, by wealthy believers who give to the work of God. But for this young man, it's an issue. What's your issue? What do you need to get rid of? What do you need to put on the shelf? Because it's wrong? No. Because it's sinful? No, not necessarily. Because it's in the way. Do we see the difference? Because it's in the way. What's in the way in your life? What's in the way in my life? Singleness of heart. Devotion to a singular pursuit. What's the third uh, necess necessity for moving into the future God has for us. It's this, direction for the future. Beginning of verse 13, Paul said, um, he said, uh, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. First of all, to move into God's ordained future for us, we need to forget the past. Forget the past. Say, so Pastor Tim, I, I can't forget the past. Well, you understand what we mean by forget. We, we, we understand the past, and, and we can learn from the past. I, I think the problem in life is too many people don't learn from the past. Right? But I, I, I've, I've used this analogy before. Our look into the past should be a brief look just to learn, just to remember but our focus should always be on the future. It's like when you're driving your car down the highway and you're going to change lanes. You have to look in the rearview mirror, in the side view mirror, don't you? Yes. And even, even so, there's, a, there's what they call a blind spot that your side view mirror doesn't, doesn't uh, see. What do you have to do? You have to take a quick turn back. I mean, that's one of the challenging things, I think, for new drivers is to learn without losing control. Take that quick look back Know that it's clear and move forward. That's how we should regard our past in life. We need to take a quick look back. Yeah, remember this lesson? Remember this time God came through for me? Remember this mistake I made and I want to learn from it? Yeah, quick look back. But let me tell you, if you and I have too much of a focus on the past, it's going to be like driving that car and looking too long in the back. Guess what? You're going, to drive into, you're going to drive into something in front of you. Forget the past. Uh, John R. Rice said, no matter what you did in the past, I love this, your future is clean. Isn't that awesome? See, the power of Jesus' blood washes away our past. How many are thankful for that? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. To the, to the, to the blood-bought child of God, the past is no longer an issue. Our sins are no longer held against us. Our mistakes uh, do not need to bind us uh, to behavior that's going to uh, uh, sidetrack us. The past is the past. Proverbs 24, 16 says, Though a righteous man falls seven times, he rises again. Hallelujah. So Pastor Tim, man, I have all this stuff from my past. Yeah, and the enemy wants to keep you chained to your past so you can't move into the future. You've heard this before. It, it's, it's become cliched, but it's so powerful. Whenever the devil reminds you of your past, just remind him of his future. Uh -huh. Hallelujah. Amen. That he loses in the end. Yeah. Bible says he's a liar. He's the father of lies. Hallelujah. Whatever your past is, whatever mistakes you've made, whatever 
uh, problems you've endured, your past is right there in the past. So forget the past. And then Paul said, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. Focus on the future. Focus on the future. Hallelujah. How many know God has an awesome future planned for you? Hallelujah. He does. He does. And the future he has planned for you is a billion times better than the one you have planned for you. Do we believe that? And, 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 and our, the, the, the focus of our life needs to be, Lord, help me to focus on your preferred future for me. Doesn't matter what your mistakes are. The great leader Winston Churchill said this, success is the ability to move from one failure to the next. Direction for the future. Straining toward what is ahead. Paul, Paul uses the, the uh, language of athletic competition. You ever see, you ever see runners in a, in a race getting close to that finish line? Man, their chest is sticking out. They're straining to move forward. It's time we stop being chained by our past, church. It's time we say, Lord, I want to move into the bright, beautiful future you have for me. We don't know what lies ahead, do we? We make plans, but we don't. How, how, how many know a few plans were upended in 2020? Uh, right? We don't know what's coming, but you know what? Our Heavenly Father does. And He still has plans for us. God wasn't caught off guard by COVID one little bit. And God didn't change his plans for your life because of COVID or social injustice or economic downturn or anything else. Nothing could change the plans God has for your life. Hallelujah! Hallelujah. Glory to God! Hallelujah. Hallelujah! So direction for the future. You know, people, it's, uh, you, you, the use of GPS has become ubiquitous. And I'm thankful for it because I'm directionally challenged. My wife will tell you. I couldn't drive out of a paper bag without directions. So I'm thankful for it. But how, how many know they can lead you astray sometimes? You know? They can get you off track in the middle of nowhere. And, uh, you know, most of the time they work pretty well depending on what we use. But sometimes, you know, so, uh, and, and what path are you following for your future? Who's laying out the directions toward your future? God in his holy word and by his Holy Spirit speaking in our spirits wants to lead you and me into the future he has for us. Are we hearing his voice? Do we pray about major decisions? Do we seek God's future for our lives? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 in the New American Standard Bible says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. God's direction is always forward. Did you know airplanes don't have a reverse gear? <laughs> if they're not, if, 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 not in the air anyway. If they're not moving forward, something's wrong. If we're not moving forward in Jesus, something's wrong. We need direction for the future. God will lead you. He might not tell you where you're going to be five years from now or 10 or 20 years from now. But here's what he'll tell you, what the next step is. But what's the step after that? Just take this step. Okay, Lord, we take that step. Okay, now here's the next one. Pastor Tim, I, I can't work like that. I need, to, I need to have this, you know, laid out. No, you just need to trust God. You trusted him when you gave him your heart. Can't you trust him for direction for your future one step at a time if that's what it takes? Direction for the future. What's the fourth necessity for moving forward in God? It's determination to reach the goal. Paul said... In verse 14, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I press on. I don't give up. I don't 
turn aside. I don't throw my hands up and say, it's no good. I can't make it. We give up too soon. We become too weary. We just sometimes need to shake ourselves a little bit. Say, I'm not giving up. Because here's the thing we know. When we move, uh, do our best to move to the future and follow after God and move to the future he has for us, not everybody's going to be in agreement with the path we take. Not everybody's going to pat you on the back. Matter of fact, you'll have people saying, no, 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 no. You need, yeah, that doesn't make any sense. You need to go this way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but God told me go this way. Right. No, 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 no. You, 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 no, no, that doesn't make it. You need to go this way. No, we need to go this way. And if you and I give up too easily, we're going to miss out on the future God has for us. You may be here today, you may say, Pastor Tim, I'm going through struggles, man. Nobody, nobody knows about it, but it's just so hard. It's all I can do to get up out of bed in the morning to move on with my day. I get it. I get it. But you need to fight through that. You need to not give up. You need to trust in the Lord. The Lord is your strength. The Lord will make your path clear. The Lord will guide you. The Lord will remove obstacles. Come on, church. We either believe this or we don't. We need to press on. We need to press on. But Pastor Tim, it's hard. Anything in life worth anything is hard. President Kennedy in his inauguration speech talked about sending a man to the moon in that decade, which was accomplished after his death. He said, why do we do these difficult things? Because they're hard. Because they're not worth anything if they're not hard. Determination to reach the goal. For over two decades, Mark Hansen Jack, and Jack Canfield shared stories of hope, inspiration, and encouragement in their seminars. When they saw how their stories touched people's lives, they tried to find a publisher to put them in the print. Some publishers thought their stories were just too nicey-nice. Others said nobody wants to read a book of little stories. Other publishers just said no. Listen to this. After three years and 33 rejections. How many want to be honest like me and said, I'd have given up after about three, you know? I like to think not, but three years, 33 rejections, they finally found someone who would publish chicken soup for the soul. They've sold millions and millions of copies because they didn't give Luke 9.62, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. I know it gets tough sometimes. I know it seems hard to serve God sometimes. It seems hard to trust him and to move forward. Much easier just to maintain the status quo. Let me tell you, don't give up. Don't give up. God has a future for you. It may not all be clear right now, but you can trust him. He will lead you into a future. He will lead you into the place that he has for you, whether it has to do with your job or your family or something else in your life. What things are necessary for us to move forward into what God has for us? First, there needs to be a holy dissatisfaction with where we are. God, I thank you for what you've done in my life, but I know there's more. I don't want to, I'm, I'm happy you brought me this far, but I don't want to stay here. Dissatisfaction with where we are. Second, devotion to a singular pursuit. Lord, you're gonna, you're, Lord, pursuing you, spiritual things are going to be number one in my life. Number three, direction for the future. God, I can come up with my own agenda, but it's not a fraction as good as the one you have for me. What is your direction? Maybe one step at a time, but Lord, I'm going to follow your direction for the future. And number four, Lord, uh, I'm going to be determined, determination to reach the goal. Not going to give up. Hallelujah. You and I can make progress and move toward the future God has for us.